I'm Eric David Kastanitz, and tonight I'll be telling you about the highest and best use of a particular piece of property. But first, I want to introduce you to this doctor. He, along with his partners, purchased that medical center about 20 years ago. They've been practicing there ever since, and his daughter even joined the practice a few years ago. Family business, indeed. After 55 years of the property functioning as a medical center, the doctor asks himself, is this the highest and best use of my property? And if it's not, how do I profit from it? So let's start with what is a highest and best use analysis. Well, it consists of four different tests, usually. First, physical feasibility. Can I build physically what I want to build? Second, legal feasibility. Am I allowed, am I permitted to build what I want to build? Third, financial feasibility. Does it make economic sense for me to build the use that I want? And finally, maximum productivity. Is this the most profitable of all of the feasible uses? So let's start with the site characteristics. We'll say, we'll call it the physical. Well, the property is located in Falls Church in Fairfax County, situated along Route 50, Arlington Boulevard, right near Seven Corners, it's in Bailey's Crossroads area. The property is in a dense, mixed location, mixed use location, but there's no frontage. It's not transit oriented development, it's not really walkable to a metro stop. It's highly underutilized in terms of bar permissibility. And finally, parking. While the current parking in place does not conform to Fairfax County's, Fairfax County's current zoning usage um, allowability for parking. So before we go any further, now that we know a little bit about the property, some of you might be asking or thinking, well, how much is this property worth? Well, it's an important point because we'll need to know the valuation for the highest and best use analysis. So taking multiple uh, different valuation scenarios under direct cap comparables and TCF, we come to uh, a valuation of $3.43 million. That's for the current use using market rates, um, uh, using market statistics. Uh, now, just one point, on a residual basis, so if a developer were looking at this property, and the developer figures out that there is a higher and a better use, the valuation could be much higher. Same for on a leverage basis, DCF cash flow, um, that could be much higher as well. But we'll stick with this, it's a, it's a conservative number and we'll go from there. So legally, how do we know what we're allowed to build? Because that's part of the feasibility analysis, right? Well, we're in Fairfax County, so in order to, to create the use that you, that you want, You'll have to pass the zoning ordinance, okay? And it'll, to, it'll will also have to comply with the comprehensive plan. If the use does not conform with, with both of those, then a developer will need to rezone or amend the comprehensive plan, both of which are very costly and take a lot of time. So you can expect a lot of proffers in that, in that process. So let's take all of this knowledge, all of these, uh, all this information that we've discussed so far, so far, the physical and the legal. Mix it all together and you can start crossing off the list impermissible uses. And what we're left with is three possible re redevelopment scenarios. First, Class A office as of right. Second, multifamily condominiums for sale. And third, luxury multifamily, luxury townhomes for sale. Both of the latter would require rezoning, um, and we'll get to that in a moment. So we have the legal, we have the physical. Let's start discussing the preliminary financial feasibility analysis for the three chosen redevelopments as compared to the current use. So under the current use, the medical center, it actually is showing an annualized return of 7.13%. That's on a lever basis. 65% LTC, fairly profitable, $827,000 on a uh, $3.5 million project. For a Class A office, 
it appears we have somewhat of a break-even scenario, which is fine for, let's say, nonprofits or an institution that wants to have a headquarters, uh, but for a landowner that wants to maximize profit, maybe it's not the way to go. Condominiums appears to be uh, unprofitable, probably because of the expensive parking that's required underground and the rezoning proffers that would be required. But take, take a look at townhomes. Almost 20% annualized return. And that includes the rezoning process. $31 million project, $8.1 million net profit. So it's fair to say that townhomes, of the scenarios that we've discussed, would be considered the highest and best use for this piece of property. The townhomes are physically feasible. They're um, the most profitable of the four scenarios. Townhomes are contiguous with the surrounding townhomes next to it. The county should be uh, should like the fact that there's downzoning involved from a potential 165,000 square foot commercial office building to one development of 57 townhomes. No structure parking is involved as we have two garage spaces per unit in home. And finally, there is rezoning risk and proffers, but we tell the doctor, look, you need to decide 7% return in the current use or 20% annualized return for the townhome project. The doctors evaluate and they say, sure, we like the 13% premium over the current use. We think it outweighs the rezoning risk. Let's do it. But before we, before we commit, what would this type of project look like? Well, for starters, four years from start to finish, from the application of rezoning until the sale of the last unit, looking at four years. A market study is conducted, and data will show that three main demographics would flock, well, would hopefully flock to this type of property. First, baby boomers looking to downsize. Second, millennials with children, probably priced out of Arlington and the District of Columbia and Alexandria. And finally, young professionals in general looking to purchase a home. So, then the doctor says, well, okay, that's great, but I want, to, I want to actually see what this project will look like. Well, here's a rough sketch. 57 townhomes, nice little playground on the eastern side, great for families. Um, you'll notice on the western side, there's a path leading from the property to Target next door, increases walkability. People love that this, these days. And you'll notice on the western side a lot of buffering and a lot of green space. That will be required by Fairfax County, according to Fairfax County officials. So, doctor says, okay, that's great. This all sounds awesome, but I don't know the first thing about developing property. So, then we introduce the concept of a joint venture. And in this joint venture structure, which is fairly typical, you have the landowner who contributes the property to a special purpose entity and in exchange receives equity in the, in the special purpose entity. The developer, on the other hand, comes in, provides the remaining equity capital that's required for the project and the sweat equity. And as incentive for this sweat equity, the developer will, will achieve uh, one, fees, and two, a back-end promote. Or in other words, the developer will, re will receive higher proceeds disproportionately to the, the project returns um, once the project receives a certain threshold metric. And just to come full circle, and for, for uh, just to come full circle, as is typical for the structure, developer may be comprised of one, a money partner who funds most of the equity, and two, a sponsor who does most of the, the sweat equity. Um, and typically there's a promote net structure as well. So $31 million project consists of land, hard costs, soft costs, financing costs, and at $20,000 per unit, around $1.1 million in profits, just for, just for doing business in Fairfax County. Capital stack, equity, 6.2 million, 20%. That, that'll be split between the landowner and the developer. Mezzanine funding, 
interest rate at 9%, 15% per, 15 loan to cost ratio. Now, the interest is slightly higher than the senior bank loan. They're taking on more risk, but with this project, 9% is still positive leverage and it's accretive to returns. And finally, at 65% loan to cost, senior bank loan, $20 million uh, for, the, for the project. So here's a visual depiction of developer and landowner equity contributions. So, that, so that's great, but what, we're all here because we wanna know what kind of returns will we be making or will the, the doctors be making on this type of property. So let's get right into it. Let's start with the property level. Property looks like it'll, it's projecting $7.2 million net profit on a $6.2 million equity investment. That comes to about 25% leveraged IRR and more than double the equity contribution. But what about the doctors, right? Our protagonists in this story, what do they stand, what do they stand to make? Well, on a $3.43 million property contribution, they stand to make $3 million net profit, almost double the equity invested, and a leveraged IRR of 20%. But, but who really make, who really is incentivized to get this deal done? Who really makes the most money here? Well, as you may have guessed, it's the sponsor. $270,000 equity contribution stands to net $1.3 million at an IRR leveraged of 62%. That's the power of the promote, and that doesn't even include fees. So doctor says, wow, these numbers are looking really good, but what if the Great Recession rears its ugly head again and just the market tanks? Well, the project will lose money to the tune of $2.7 million. That's a leverage IRR of negative 12%. But then you say, that's only one side of the coin. What if the property outperforms? Well, in a best case scenario, property will net $16 million at a 55% IRR. Doctors say, well, that sounds pretty good, so I'm in. So that's the highest and best use analysis for this particular piece of property. It can be applied to any landowner, any small business landowner, but, but the missing piece of the puzzle, why do I care about this seemingly random piece of property in the middle of suburban Virginia. Well, you remember that doctor in the first slide? Well, th that's my dad. <laughs> and that sponsor who stands to net a good, good portion of uh, money for sweat equity, well, hopefully that's me applying what I've learned here at Georgetown. And as for money partner, well, maybe that's someone in this room right now. So, thank you. Very good. Thank you, Eric. All right, any questions? So I have a question. Um, I, I thought you did a really good uh, analysis um, with your multifamily analysis. Two questions, though. Uh, one, I said, the analysis took into account multifamily condos. Did you look at multifamily apartments, and did I miss that? I did. and. That was one of the first analyses that I did. Apologies for taking so much time, but I want to show you the other possible scenarios that were that were crossed off the list. So, multifamily apartments, they were analyzed. The problem is, this is not transit-oriented development. The nearest metro is two and a half to three miles away, and Multifamily apartments, the type of person that's living in there, the demographics that's attracted to it, they really rely on public accessibility. Um, moreover, the area it's not, uh, doesn't have, say, the prestige of a, of a Tyson's or uh, Roslyn Balson Corridor or the District of Columbia, so didn't think that from a feasibility standpoint it would work. Mm -hmm. Was there a second part to that question? And yeah, so I think I know uh, how you got there, but be so because you crossed out apartments uh, mm -hmm. because it wasn't metro accessible, and you uh, seem like your conclusion in ruling out condos is because of the expense of underground structured parking. That's one of the reasons, correct. 
And, and why did you look at above grade structured parking? Yeah, and actually, um, and can you talk a little bit about that? Why? Sure. If you look at the way that the property um, is shaped, it's somewhat of an odd shape. It looks almost like a a, a lamb shank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a pipe stand driveway, and, and that counts towards the far and the, the square footage that you could build a building. But because it's shaped like that, you can't put parking on the pipe stand, so that's really not usable. So when, you build, when you're maxing out your building, um, you don't have the full access of the property to build outward for, for surface level parking. Now that said, the analysis does take into account that I think around two thirds of the parking will be underground and there will be extra space. Maybe I, I think I came to about one third where there could be surface level parking and that was taken into account in the analysis. But keep in mind, it's not just buildable square footage, it's green space and um, and you also have other impermeable services like um, street uh, access going throughout the property. Mm -hmm. So that, that was taken into account. Okay, and one last question before I pass sure. up the baton here. Um, did you look at senior housing and assisted living options? Um, I did, and based on my discussions with several industry <coughs> participants, it would be an interesting use for the property, but for the purpose of the highest and best use study, I thought it was a little too specific, mm -hmm. and the analysis would require going into how the the property would be operated, what relationship what relationship that would require with um, with either an owner or a flag uh, for the, the assisted living facility. Mm -hmm. So it is from a from a physical structure and from a legal permissibility, it, you know, it could be rezoned but from a financial standpoint, I didn't run that analysis. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, just a question on one of the initial slides on valuation. So that is the value that you have in place right now? And Applying market in statistics to the property, not actual tenant leases. So just land or the medical building as of cash flowing property. This is, so my analysis, so you could look at it from a, from a land only purchase analysis, and that's fine. Valuation would likely be much lower, uh, maybe. But from my, from my perspective, this property, if it hits the market, then it will be marketed to anyone out there, including owners who would want to purchase the property and use it as is. Um, so, a developer would still be competing with an owner operator. Or at the same time, the opportunity cost of giving up the property and the, the doctor owners, they're still, they would still be tenanted and still be using the property as is. So that's why I felt that the current analysis would require as is. Very good. Anything else? Any questions? No, I mean, I, was, I had a similar question as uh, Damon had about why did you completely neglect the apartment use of it? But you know, mm -hmm. you explained it so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Okay. Thank you.